Let me bring you in on a secret that's not so secret. Hot rodding is dying. Traditional hot rodding, at least. You're talking tea buckets, old trucks, all that stuff. Guys tinkering with their old rigs, modifying them to their liking, putting your art and your inspiration into pieces. That style of hot rodding is going away to the past. And I got a couple of reasons why. Let's talk about that. Welcome to Hi Ho Stable Garage. My credentials 1954 international chassis swap let me bring you guys in completely custom front fascia 2003 f-150 front end it has a peterbilt tilt style front end 5-4 triton two valve inside it's an automatic it's four-wheel drive custom cab recessed way way down there you're talking eight inch plus recess the bed five inch plus also long bed to short bed conversion custom frame custom floor List goes on and on and There's on. There's a couple of reasons why this type of hobby is dying off. You see it at car shows all the time. The age demographic that are attending these car shows are usually over 50. And that's no offense to anyone. That's just how it is. Now, that being said, I have a couple of reasons why I can speculate on why something like that's happening. Reason one why traditional hot rodding is disappearing is vehicle scarcity. This vehicle right here, again, I drove all the way up into Quebec. It was an 11 hour drive to get this thing there and back. 16 hours technically in my old blue, but 11 hours if you had a normal one, no pit stops, no nothing, go up, get the trailer, all that stuff. But I had to drive that far to get a split window international truck. There is absolutely none. Marketplace, Kijiji, word of mouth, none of that in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia that I know of or that anyone that I know of knew of. There's old trucks here and there, but especially on the East Coast, they're all rotten away. You're talking worse shape or this shape when you get it. Now, a big, big problem because of the scarcity of these vehicles, a good example that is restorable by the average fella that doesn't have a nice big barn like this, I'm quite fortunate, that doesn't have a welder there's a lot of people that are into cars and doing hot rodding that don't do any welding whatsoever if you don't have those type of tooling you can't work on this type of vehicle you can't work on a vehicle that needs literal fabrication work so you have to find a prime example of this or an example at least with a solid body that you can do the mechanical side and the engine side and here's the drawback this truck right here, as it sits, we just did a video on it. It's around 4,500 bucks, I think is what we have into this. If you count everything, all the materials, all the, everything, everything that we did. Now, you cannot go and buy an international L-series like this for 4,500 bucks with a decent body that needs no rust. You're talking upwards of sixty-five to $7,000 just for that. And you're, you haven't even gotten to your tires, brake wheels, and hubs. None of that. And that's where the problem arises, is the affordability to enter hot rodding nowadays is a lot higher than it used to be. It really sucks. I'm a 1998 baby, for example. So I grew up primarily in the early 2000s. Now, when I was growing up, my dad had a whole bunch of cars. At one point, we had about 40 cars in the yard. It was pretty neat. But I was just a young, young tyke back then, so I didn't know nothing about them, and I really didn't care about them. Well, we had Internationals, we had Fords, we had Chevrolets, we had a couple Dodges, all 50s and 40s trucks. We even had a whole bunch of 70s and late 60s Chevelles, a couple Novas, that kind of stuff. We got those Chevelles back in the early 2000s for, I think we got all three for less than five grand. Try to find a Chevelle, especially an SS, for less than five grand with a good body. One had a really good body, one was a donor with a good engine, and then one was simply for parts, but all three for five grand early 2000s. I think we sold them for upwards of seven back in the late 2000s, and then the price went haywire from there, but that's kind of the example I got. Even though we have all that money tied up into this, 
it's all fabrication work, and at least we're going to have a good body at the end of it. But to find this truck in original shape, you're looking at like $8,000. It's just it's just unobtainable for a lot of people getting into a hobby. Where you could pick up like a good bullnose Ford, aero nose Ford, square body Chevrolet. Usually those prices are more around the four grand to three grand range. For a decent example, might not have the best paint, might not have the best drivetrain in it, but at least you have a solid body to go off of. The 50 stuff, you're getting away from that. Another reason why is paperwork. That's one of the reasons why we paid what we did for the original body for this International. I think it was 1500 bucks down in Quebec. You can't find a lot of 50s vehicles around here with a clean title. Now, your state or province, depending if you're a Canadian, United Statesian, <laughs> from the United States, Australia, something like that, you have different areas, but... Depending on where you're from, you need a registration. You might need an inspection. We need clean registrations around here. You can't make a registration out of nothing. If you find a vehicle in the woods, you can't just go register it. You can't just go drive it. It's almost impossible to put that guy back on the road unless you find the original owner. Unless, <laughs> that, At least that's how it is in New Brunswick. And when you're talking a vehicle this old, the original owner might be very, very much long gone. So you have to track down the head of a state, and then they might be gone, head of a state. It's a vicious cycle. So if you find a vehicle without papers around here, you can't really do much with it. Cost and availability, but there's another one. That's laws. Laws is a big one that you can't skate around, especially in New Brunswick. But they're pushing for all new vehicles to be electric by a certain standpoint. What's going to happen to the old vehicles, you think? There's a lot of the younger generation my age, younger, little bit older, that are getting into this hobby and they don't see a future. Because why would you build something like this and hope that maybe one day you can pass it down to the next generation, your boy or your girl, but they might not be able to use it. They might not, it just might be a gigantic paperweight that dad made, you know what I mean? You might not be able to even drive the thing. People aren't dumb, so when they kind of see, uh. If it's going to take five years and 10 grand to put into a vehicle, well, five years from now, fellas, that's 2028. If all new vehicles by 2035 are there, you don't got a lot of room left. You know what I mean? And to tie all three of those points up, let's basically go to the changing of the guard. As I said, for these car shows and not so much performance events, but for car shows where you demonstrate your skill and you show off what you made, the age demographic is going to dwindle. That's just how age works. And now you don't have any new people replacing that. That's how things slowly disappear. That's how this hobby will slowly disappear. Sorry, RX-7 first. We have a carbureted 302 HO. So it's a very, very primitive ignition box on this. It is digital ignition, but very primitive. But the rest of it is simply just a 302 carbureted basic ignition system very basic alternator that kind of stuff then it's just a push rod v8 nothing too complex about this if you want to get into engines this is a great one to start off with it's where we all come from at the end of the day we all started somewhere a little push rod v8 like a 302 350 chevy 318 mopar all those engines are great engines to start out on and learn basic stuff. Now, let's go over to the International real quick. Open this guy up. There we go. So here, we have a cam on both sides. It's overhead cam, and it's a 90 degree spread bore block. Aluminum heads, that kind of stuff. It's still a V8, but look at all these wires, vacuum hoses, electrical system it's fuel injection so it's all run off by the computer and it's the changing with the times there's no getting around that but for someone starting out if this is your engine pool and you want to learn basic 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 mechanical stuff before you jump into this that's a lot of meat to chew versus a little 302 push rod is nice and easy so what i'm getting to here fellas is basically that engine, if that's what you have to start off with, and that's all what you have going in around you, is, let's say, a 03 V8 Triton, and that's for me. Back, if you go another 10 years, you're talking about Coyote engines, 
dual overhead cam, like. And that's for me. Now, if you start the hobby and you're starting with fuel injection, engines and all that stuff, and you know nothing about, if you come, now, if you come into this hobby and you're green as grass and you want to learn and you're thrown into a pit with a thousand vacuum lines, a thousand electrical cords, computers, a whole bunch of stuff all to run one engine, passive anti-theft systems, collision systems, all that stuff all loomed into the exact same harness versus a nice simple 302, which one would have been easier to learn on? Well, there's not a whole lot of 302 vehicles on the road in the junkyards. And I'm talking the mainstream junkyards, not the mom and pop shops, junkyards that you guys know about down at your hometown. None of that stuff. I'm talking Kenny Upol. It's, it's mostly Japanese and Korean cars with the occasional American vehicle and the V8 single overhead cam or dual overhead cam. Just starting out, if that's what you have to deal with and it's such a learning curve, it can throw off a lot of guys getting into this stuff. And again, you can say, just go buy a secondhand used push rod engine, basic or system. But what happens again is the scarcity. It all depends on your location. If you live in Texas, you most likely have a whole bunch of these guys running around and that's okay. But for the rest of the Northern climates, other spots around the world, all these vehicles are pushing a pretty penny nowadays for a good example that you can wrench on mom and pop or dad and son wise. So if you're trying to get into it green as grass and you know nothing, it's quite a steep learning curve and it's going to put off a lot of people. Another point that we touched on on this channel would be basically the internet's been lying to you or TV shows have been lying to you. We touched on this a couple times on this channel on how the expectations seen online versus reality are quite, quite different. Let me bring you guys in. This fender is pretty much all done up now other than a couple little rust repair holes, but spreading it and doing that patch, we're basically done. But I'm bringing you guys over because this right here, we made a short video on and it did quite well. But the video title was, Don't Let the Internet Lie to You. And what I talked about in that video is this right here in car shows or some YouTube channels? I won't even mention it because I don't want to put anyone on blast. But they might say that that's a 20 minute job. Well, before I even finished welded that, I had close to two hours in it with all these little slices. And there's a whole bunch of other ways you could have done this. Yes, that would have been faster. But that's also people that have the tooling. As you see, we're just in a, in a basic shop, basic barn. No tooling. We had a pine block and a hammer. So I opted to do slices, kind of like a Terry's chocolate orange. And that worked out great, but it ate up a lot of time. We had the rest of the truck. The whole cab putting it on took time. Taking the 2003, blowing it all apart so we could put the cab initially on it took time. Doing the front end took a lot of time. Doing the box is taking a lot of time. Rear frame section took a lot of time. All that stuff took a bunch, bunch of time. And there's a few channels on YouTube that they, you know, say that you can do a chassis swap in a weekend kind of deal. What kind of happens at that point is either your product might be a little low class, your skill set is a lot higher than what you're letting on, tooling, skills, that kind of stuff, or, you know, you're straight up lying. And that kind of sucks. But... What happens is you get a whole bunch of gung-ho fellers, just like myself, likely when I started off this. I was saying, oh yeah, I'll have that done in a month. Well, we started this in March and it's just starting to look like a truck now. So bear that in mind. And that's me working on it. Maybe you might be a little faster or a little slower, but take that as you will. A couple channels that I know you can trust, Vice Grip Garage, Casey's Customs, Puddin's Fab Shop, those three off the top of my head, I think Junkyard Digs does good stuff too, but basically those are channels that you know, they'll tell you how it is, especially Derek from Vice Grip Garage, can't go wrong with that fella, but basically they'll tell you if, if they're going to be working on something that's going to take a long time, they're not going to sugarcoat it, that's just how it is. Or you think we got off track, we didn't, 
I'm talking about expectations. So if you get into this hobby and you think, oh, I'll be able to finish something like this in a month, two weeks, something like that, because I watched a 15 minute or a 20 minute video online, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. And when you're green as grass, again, and you don't have experience with time frames, that kind of stuff, it can be really disappointing when you see other vehicles that are done that said it's going to take this amount of time and you do it and it seems like you're not gaining any progress. So you lose confidence in yourself and you shelve the project. Now it's on jack stands forever or someone else goes and buys it. Now you might be asking yourself, can we save traditional hot rodding, putting engines in different things or modifying chassis and a whole bunch of stuff? And the answer the short answer is no. There's no way that you can alter how things are going unless there's a huge market collapse or for some reason the price of old vehicles goes down where they're obtainable to the average feller working hard every day. Money doesn't go as far as it did, fellas. This is how things are. But if these went down in price, a lot of more guys could get them and you would get the fellas that... Price might be the only thing keeping them out of the hobby. That's not going to gain the people that are green as grass. None of that stuff. That is going to have to be basically a change in lifestyle on social media. All that stuff. Changing from, let's say, a click-based type video format to more of an educational type video format. But that's never going to happen because that doesn't generate money. Give it another 15, 20 years and... Things are going to be interesting, you know what I mean? I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys really soon on this International in the next video. See you guys.